The psalmist says in Psalm 49, Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed, and though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go down to the generation of his fathers who will never again see light. Man in his pomp and yet without understanding is like the beasts that perish. We're going to sing to begin our service a version of uh, Psalm 49. You'll find it at number 49 in our blue books here. O oh, people, listen. Hear God's wisdom crying. Although the darkness comes to rich and poor and nothing mortal can survive our dying, yet in the morning justice shall endure. Number 49. Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. We come together, Lord, as we've sung, so that together we might worship and adore your holy name and proclaim that name and give thanks and rejoice in you, our God and our Savior, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, the only God, the one who is the maker of heaven and earth, and the ruler of all worlds, and the judge also of all in heaven and in earth. And what comfort we have, Lord, in your throne of justice and judgment to know that your righteousness does endure, that when all that is of this world passes away, it will be the treasures of your heavenly kingdom alone that will remain. And those who have loved and valued those treasures, these alone are the ones that will outlive the sun. We thank you, Lord, that we know 
the brightness of your face. Because only when your face continues to shine will there be life. Can there be life? Life in its fullness. Life that is everlasting. We saw this week just what it means for the light of the sun to be covered even for a few minutes. And the darkness and the coldness that shrouded the earth. How much more dark and cold and terrible must existence be with your face shielded from us. And to imagine that face shielded forever. Grant, O God, our Father, that we shall never face that darkness. So grant us light, we pray. Grant us the light of your countenance that comes to us even now in the gospel of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Grant us that light, we pray always, to fill our lives, to light up our lives even now with the everlasting light of heaven itself. And to lighten our lives now to give us meaning, to give us purpose. Grant us fruitfulness and faithfulness in your sight as we walk our path in this world and seek with our hand in yours to walk it for all eternity. So, Lord, help us, we pray. Draw near to us this morning. Fill our lives afresh with the light of your love and the light of your life that we might be a people who bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so bring glory to you forever and ever. And these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our great Savior. Amen. Let me uh, welcome you uh, all this morning to our fellowship here at the Tron. If you're new with us, if it's your first time, or if you're visiting, uh, we welcome you very particularly in the Lord's name, and uh, we hope you'll feel at home with us. Half of you, of course, are downstairs. I can't see you. I hope you can see us and hear us, and I uh, look forward to meeting you after the service. Uh, we meet again this evening, as usual, at 6.30, and we warmly invite you again to join with us there. Uh, Bob Fowle will be preaching to us, continuing in Hebrews, and uh, there'll be opportunity, as always, to encourage one another uh, as we meet together following the service. You should have one of these leaflets uh, either found on your seat or put into your hand on the way in. I want to draw your attention to one or two things there, and uh, in a moment, Terry uh, McCutcheon is going to come and speak to us about some of the events on an Easter week. You see there, uh, this coming week, all the normal things going on in the life of the church. Uh, this Wednesday evening is small groups, and uh, if you'd like to know more about those, or if you're quite you, haven't found yourself uh, find your way into one of these groups yet, please do speak to me afterwards or speak to one of the church staff or the stewards. Uh, we'd be glad to point you in the right direction. We're keen to get as many folk as possible involved in uh, some small group fellowship outside the life of uh, Sundays. And uh, so there is information down at the reception desk about those things. But those meet this week, and uh, you'll see the other things uh, going on uh, as usual. Look down at the bottom right, and you'll see that next Saturday we have another wedding, Ab Abraham and Sari, and uh, I'm sure you want to be remembering them and praying for them, and they'd be delighted if you came and joined them in the service, which will be here uh, on Saturday at 2 o'clock. Uh, so do have them in your prayers for this coming week. But uh, where are you, Terry? You're going to come and speak about uh, some of the events weeks. You should have one of these uh, cards um, on your chair. But before I speak about that, uh, one event that's not um, on the card is we'll have the boys' football again this Easter. Um, Monday the 6th, Tuesday the 7th, and Wednesday the 8th of April um, at a, a different venue this year. We're going to be in uh, Tory Glen Regional Football Centre. There's these sign-up forums. Uh, girls, unfortunately, it's only for the boys. Um, age 7 to 18, um, and you can get these down at the reception desk. All the details um, are there. Um, as Wally said, we're having an events week. Um, events are, are one way to do evangelism, not the only way. One way to do evangelism, and we have a, 
um, a series of events on this, this Easter, and I just want to draw your attention um, to a few of those. We've tried to cater for um, everybody, but unfortunately you, you always can't do that. But um, just a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. Um, I'll mention the most important thing first. Um, on the Thursday evening, there's a men's curry evening. Uh, I don't really need to say any more, except that the tickets are five pounds and they're going quickly, men. Um, so please buy one, buy one for a friend, buy a couple for a friend. This is what it's all, it's, it's not for us to come and, and have, a, have a meal together. It's for us to invite people um, in order that they might hear something about the gospel. Um, so tickets on sale during the reception, uh, five pound, and that's on the Thursday, um, 2nd of April. We're running the Mark Drama again. Um, if anybody's seen that, they'll, they'll know what a great, a great evangelism tool that is. Um, every word of Jesus from Mark's gospel, um, done in 90 minutes. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and it will be running in uh, two places this year. Um, on Sunday the 29th of March, um, we're putting on Mark's drama at <coughs> Cross Hill Evangelical Church. So for folks that maybe stay in the south side, uh, that, that might be the place for you to go, maybe to buy some tickets and, um, and take some friends there. And then we'll have it here in the church um, on Monday the 30th. Um, last thing I just want to draw your attention to is on the Tuesday night, um, we have a quiz night. Um, you know, there's lots of questions that we, we think about in life. What's right, what's wrong? Who am I going to marry? Well, Abri and Sari have got that one worked out, haven't they? Um, you know, um, where will I work? Will Motherwell survive in the Premiership this year? But there's one question that's, that's the most important question of all. Who is Jesus Christ? And through all our events this Easter, that's the question we want folks to be considering. Who is Jesus Christ? I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm sitting with pals or family, I, I don't find it too easy to get to that. Maybe for fear of rejection fear of ridicule. But everybody loves a quiz. Everybody loves a curry. You can bring them along in a non-threatening environment. You can hear something of the gospel. Folks can get their appetites whetted with the gospel. And it maybe gives you a platform then um, to take that further in conversation. Maybe suggesting to folks to come and do Christianity Explored. Maybe they would want to read uh, Mark's gospel where you want to one. So please, please, we've got a lovely new building. Um, we've got a good staff team that, that do all sorts. And, but please make, make use of these events. Bring people. Be bold. Be bold this Easter. We've been, recently we've been in Ephesians chapter 2 that says, outside of Jesus, people are dead and they're doomed. That's what the cross teaches us. Either people are in Jesus or are in their sin. So be courageous and ask folks to come this Easter. Thanks, Terry. We'll do uh, use the cards and uh, make these invitations. We're going to turn to our Bible reading now this morning, which you'll find in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. And if you have one of the church uh, Bibles, it's page 871. And we're continuing our studies here in uh, Jesus' teaching along the road as he is leading his disciples on the road to glory. Jesus takes them on a path which leads for him through Jerusalem and the cross and explains to them along the way the priorities for everyone who follows on that road. And that's what we're uh, studying in these chapters together. And we come to Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, at verse 13. And just notice that this follows on immediately from the previous paragraph we looked at last week, where Jesus is talking about very deep and eternal matters, judgment and salvation, heaven and hell, life and death. And verse 13 in the context of listening to all of that, we read this. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to him, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, 
For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat, nor about your body, what you'll put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouses nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you're not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you're to eat and what you're to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom. These things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager or steward whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master's delayed in coming. If he begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful, the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Here's the point. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. 
I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until that is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Amen. May God bless to us His Word. We're going to sing now hymn number 857, which reminds us that Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden store, from each rival that would claim us, saying, Christian, love me more. Number 857. Well, as the musicians play in the quietness and as our offerings are received, you might like to read again these words we'll be studying shortly.
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're glad that as your people, you call us to come before you, to bring prayers and supplications on a scale that is wide, that covers this world, that you command us to pray for kings and rulers, for governments and powers, because you are the God who has appointed the powers that be. You have given our world structures of government and of leadership, of law and order, of institutions of state, and all kinds of things that are given by your grace that is common to all mankind, that even as you feed the birds and decorate this world with the beauty of nature, so also you have in your kindness and in your mercy given to humanity structures and powers that prevent us from running wild, from spreading the evil from our own hearts, which would otherwise, if left unchecked, destroy our societies, our world, our whole planet very, very quickly. Help us to remember, Lord, that these things are true when our hearts are downcast and full of despair about the nature of the governments and leadership that so often seems to be in the ascendancy in our world when we feel that things are going from bad to worse and that we would be better without any of these things. Remind us, Lord, of the truth of your word that teaches us how much worse this world would be were it not for your grace in bringing these structures common to man. And yet, Lord, you do command and teach us to pray for those in power that their structures would be good and full of righteousness and justice and not evil and wickedness and injustice and oppression. We know there are many parts of our world where people live in subjugation to terror, to dictatorships and despotic rule. We think of many parts of the world where that is the case. We pray for those and very especially, we pray for <clears throat> those who are our brothers and sisters in the Christian church, living in lands like North Korea, living in lands like Syria, which not only are ruled by dictators, but are torn apart by civil war. And we thank you, Lord, for your mercy to us and for the freedoms that we have enjoyed for so many generations. We pray for those in lands that are dark in the shadow of the iron grip of despotic power. We pray, too, for those places where all rule and all law and order seems to be breaking down, where people live with the opposite but equally terrible manifestation of anarchy and everyone doing that which is right in their own eyes. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the peaceful democracy that we in this nation and many other Western nations have enjoyed for many centuries. Remind us, Lord, of our privilege, even when we despair at the rising tide of political bickering and chattering and positioning that is going on in the months leading up to our general election. We do pray, Lord, that you would guard us and keep us from descending into complete cynicism about the politics and the rule in our land. But we do pray, Father, that you would have mercy upon our nation, that you would give us a government better than the one that we deserve. We pray for those in public life, for those who will be on the campaign trail in the weeks to come for all that we'll be speaking on the radio and the television and in our newspapers. We dare to pray, Heavenly Father, for our concentrating on the matters of substance and importance, that we as a population, as a nation, 
we'll be able to see beyond the mere pounds, shillings, and pence of whichever party promises us a few more pounds in our wallet after May. We would see the true freedoms that we have cherished in the past and that matter. The freedom to speak and to speak the truth of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would guard and protect that right, even though it may mean protecting the right also for others to speak terrible blasphemy and to speak filth and obscenity. We would live in a society where it is still possible to proclaim in our streets and in our schools and hospitals and public places to speak a word for the Lord Jesus Christ without fear of reprisal and losing one's job and being taken to court. We do want to pray very particularly uh, this week for the court case brought by the Equalities Commission of Northern Ireland against the Ashes Bakery, simply because the Christian proprietors of that business declined the opportunity to bake a cake bearing the slogan, Fight for Gay Marriage. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bring justice in their case and show to the world the folly of such intolerance that would refuse people the right even to decline a political and a moral message to which they are deeply opposed without any prejudice to the people or any hatred in their hearts or any desire for anything other than to stay true to their Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, for many others who have been found in similar situations, victims of aggressive bullying and hatred and intolerance by those pushing their particular agenda. But such is the strength of the arm and the power in our press, in the media, and even in the corridors of power today. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bring justice in that case and bring protection to many others who simply seek to live their lives in accordance with your will and your purpose and to be witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for protection in our society, for those freedoms, but we also pray, Heavenly Father, for a determination and for a strength and for a commitment among us, your people, that even should such freedoms disappear and evaporate, so that to speak for Jesus does bring not only opprobrium publicly, but sanctions judicially, that you would help us still to know that there is a time to obey God and not man, and to live for that which is eternal, not for that which is merely passing. So, Lord, for our privileges, our freedoms, we give you thanks and we ask protection. But for the future, whatever it may hold, we ask strength, commitment, and unswerving devotion to you, our Savior and our Lord, so that on the last day, we will be unashamed before your throne, having confessed you fearlessly before men, and so rejoice in the joy of hearing you confess our humble names before all the angels in heaven. So to that end, O God, we pray that you would strengthen us daily by your word of power. May your Holy Spirit open that word to our hearts and open our hearts to your word, even as we come to it now, that we may go from this place equipped and strengthened comforted and encouraged to walk with you every day of our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So now as we come to God's Word, we sing the hymn on the screens. Now in reverence and awe, we gather round your Word.
Well, let's turn together to Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, and uh, page 871, if you have a church visitor's Bible. <clears throat> and the passage is all about the priority of real riches. <clears throat> it's been a week of news, hasn't it, about financial planning following the budget. All lots of talk about planning for the future, ISAs and pension pots and so on and all about the prudent handling of money and wise planning for the future. And of course, with an election coming up, the politicians know it's the economy, stupid. And in the end, the vast majority will vote with their wallets, and so they're very focused on them. And uh, Jesus also recognizes that, and it may be surprising to you that he does not deny the pursuit of riches. Indeed, in our passage today, he is giving advice on precisely how to do that successfully. Verse 33, do you see? Storing up your wealth in money bags that don't grow old and treasures that don't ever fail or fall prey to the thief or devaluation, like any euros that any of you may be foolish enough to be storing in a Greek bank account. Watch out. Make no mistake, though, Jesus wants us to be rich. He wants us to find treasure. He wants us to find a vast and satisfying reward from our lives. And real blessing, if you look at verse 44, he says, is to be set over all the master's possessions. But of course, as always, we also find that Jesus is a very contrarian investment advisor. He now 
turns the view of the world, of the herd, on its head, absolutely upside down. The way up in God's index of leading investments is down. And Jesus goes massively short on what our world's market holds long, and he buys exclusively what our world's leaders despise. Because according to Jesus, you get really rich not by getting more, but by giving more. Not by greed, but by generosity. Not by being served, but by serving. And as always, Jesus' perspective on life in this world flies in the face of the perspective of this world's best wisdom. Which is why, of course, he is the most divisive figure in human history. Look at verse 51, do you see? Do you think that I've come to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Wouldn't that be a great text for a Christmas carol service? would rather prick the bubble of Christmas sentimentality, wouldn't it? But as soon as anybody does talk about wealth, it does become divisive, doesn't it? The incessant politicking on the airwaves since the budget just proves that. So, of course, when the subject becomes ultimate wealth, well, of course, it's going to be ultimately divisive. But the mark, according to Jesus, of the real disciple, of someone who has a real and living relationship with God through Jesus Christ, is that they understand where true riches, where true and lasting treasure is to be found. And so they set their hearts on fully pursuing that and not pursuing the kind of riches that will ultimately fail and disappoint and disappear. And so in our text here, Jesus teaches us that that means having a true perspective on our possessions in this world, on our preoccupations in this world, and also, above all, on our preparedness for the world to come. Look at verses 13 to 21. They give us a perspective on our possessions in this world and on the real riches in our life. Jesus' point here is absolutely clear. He says, Only the fool lives covetously, forgetting that all things, including our life itself, are in the hands of God alone, and that true riches lies not in earthly treasures, which we must all leave behind, but in the lasting riches of his eternal kingdom. And so the priority in this life is therefore to enrich our lives now in his eyes. Verse 20, to ensure that we are rich towards God. As I said in the reading, we won't grasp the full force of Jesus' words here unless we note the context. Look back to what he's been talking about. It's a solemn discourse, isn't it? about the weighty matters of eternity, about coming judgment, about heaven and hell, about acceptance at God's judgment, street, uh, judgment seat, or worse, denial, verse 8, in front of the angels of God. So the air is heavy with the great issues of eternity, life and death, forgiveness and damnation. And yet in the midst of that, verse 13, do you see? One of the listeners is so preoccupied with the matters of worldly possessions and his earthly inheritance that he interrupts Jesus as if to say, never mind that, Jesus. I need you to get on my side in my claim against my brother in the matter of the family will. Isn't that astonishing? And yet, you know, it's not that uncommon. I remember once being at the door after preaching here on just such a solemn passage as this. And the only word I had from one of the first people who came out was, where did you get your tie? I really like it. I'd like to get one. And I wondered if they'd listened to a word that I'd been speaking about. But is that so rare? It's very easy just to come to church on Sunday because that's what you do on Sunday. And yet, to sit through the whole service without hearing very much at all because you're so preoccupied with something else entirely. And very often that thing that's preoccupying you is a sense of injustice in your life, a sense that something so unfair that's what's happening to you, and something that you want to have fixed 
And what you really want is to have Jesus speaking not words about heaven and hell and things like that, but recruiting himself to your case, to be on your side, to have him fix your issue for you and find justice in that matter in your life. Isn't that right? That's what this man's wanting in verse 13. And it's what many people want. It's what many people think Jesus is all about, bringing peace and justice now in this world in the way that we think that ought to be done. We've already seen in verse 51 what Jesus says about peace on earth. That's not why he came. And now look at verse 14, wrong again. My ministry is not to be taken up with justice here and now, he says. Who made me a judge over you? In fact, what he does is he points this man to the very great danger inherent in that whole idea. Now, we've got no idea whether this man had a fair case or not, but that's not the point, says Jesus. There's something far more important than getting earthly justice in your life, something which can be hindered even by a quest for justice which might be fair and right. There's a real danger, according to Jesus anyway, in being so earthly-minded, even about good things, that you become no heavenly use at all. It's the very opposite, isn't it, from that silly, trite little aphorism that we so often hear from those social activists. But that is what Jesus is saying here. Don't be a fool, he says to the man. And he's, in fact, telling the same thing to all of us, verse 15. Be on your guard, he says, against all covetousness, all kinds of ambition and all kinds of pursuit of the things of this world alone, even ambition for good and fair and right things, but excessive pursuit of these, seeking abundance in them. That will become, says Jesus, a dangerous impediment to finding the true riches in life and the only riches that will ever last. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now, that whole perspective on life, Jesus is saying, is absolutely wrong. Let's be clear, he's not saying that we're not to have any possessions, but what he is warning against is a totally wrong perspective that chasing abundance, chasing excess, a driven sense of needing and wanting more, that is all wrong. The relentless pursuit of anything in life, and it can be anything, that prevents us from seeing what life is really all about. Now, that may be money or an inheritance as here. Or it might be the relentless pursuit of sporting success for you, or musical achievement, or academic recognition, or relationship success, or business success, the determination to become partner in the firm, or whatever else it might be in your ambition. But if it stops you from grasping reality, it's a disaster. It blinds you to the ultimate truth that all such earthly abundance must be and will be in the end left behind. Everything that belongs to you in this life will be left behind. And for some of us, that might be sooner than we think. Only what we have become in life will outlive the grave. And how terrible to discover then that, in fact, what we've become in life is a fool. And that's what Jesus answers this man in the parable that he tells him. This man in verse 16 is rich. He's done well in life. Well, good for him. No doubt he was a skilled and hardworking farmer. He was keeping the shelves of Lidl and Aldi stocked with local produce. Well, great. We need that. Nothing wrong with that. And Jesus, interestingly, does not criticize what he does, but what he doesn't do. He points us to what his earthly success didn't do for him. For one thing, it didn't give him peace in life. It brought him more problems, financial headaches. How am I going to store all my wealth so I don't lose it? Well, that's a big question today, isn't it? In a world of currency debasement, in a world of mounting debt, how not to lose out what you have to inflation or deflation now or the next bank crash or whatever it is. And the more you have, the more you've got to lose. A real headache. So he had headaches from his wealth, not yet the happiness 
that he thought it was going to bring him. But in fact, this poor man never got there, did he? Because in the end, he was faced with ultimate loss. He was so focused on what he had gained that it blinkered him to what he hadn't gained, verse 21, riches towards God. And when God required his soul, when God brought him to judgment, he's exposed as a fool because that is the only wealth that counts for anything at all in the end. Now, a fool in the Bible's language doesn't mean someone who's, who's intellectually deficient. It means somebody who's morally and spiritually deficient. To be a fool is to live life without the right perspective about God and about our life as mortals and about God as our master and our maker. Psalm 14 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. That doesn't mean he's an atheist. There weren't atheists in the Bible like there are today. But it means that you live excluding God from your heart, from the, the control center, the thinking part of your life. You live, in other words, as if God wasn't really a force to be reckoned with, as if God was just a sort of a distant idea, a vague sort of comfort in time of trouble. As Psalm 10 said, God is not in the fool's thoughts. Your judgments are high, out of his sight. And so that means that when you know that you're living wrongly or without God's priorities in view, you say, well, as the psalm puts it, God has forgotten. He's hidden his face. He'll never see. That's a fool. But it's incredibly easy, you see, to believe the evangelical faith, as this man in the parable no doubt did. But to live day to day just like that, just pretending that God isn't really there. What a fatal mistake that is, says Jesus. But you do see, says the psalmist in Psalm 10, you note mischief and vexation, and you will take it into your hands. That is in the Bible that was being read week by week by this man in the synagogue. Psalm 39, O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Surely for nothing man heaps up wealth and doesn't know who will gather it. Or Psalm 49, as we sang, even the wise die and leave their wealth to others. Or read the book of Ecclesiastes that calls us to recognize our mortality and to understand that all of life is but passing and God's gift to man is to have joy in knowing that what really matters is to make profit and gain, to find abundance in what lasts. That is, as Ecclesiastes ends, in fearing God and keeping His commandments. For that is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed to judgment. But this man had heard all of these things in church week by week, but lived as if none of it was actually real in his life. In Jesus' terms, he heard the Word of God, but he didn't do it. Dear friends, this passage is a warning not to the atheist outside the church, but to all of us inside the church who have the Bible and who know that this life is not just physical. This man in the parable knew he had a soul. He talked about it. But he made himself believe that what his spiritual life really needed at the moment was for him to make partner in the firm or to focus on his pension or to maximize his educational potential so that in future things would be better and easier and more helpful for his spiritual life and commitment. And it's very easy to think like that, isn't it? But the more we do that, the more we just slip into the way of living as if this world was ultimate, or at least as though this world were actually much more important than the world to come. And the Bible is full of warnings to us not to do that all the way through. Way back in Deuteronomy 29, God warns the people under Moses and says, Beware the poisonous root that bears bitter fruit by thinking, Well, I'm one of God's people. And I'll be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. 
The Hebrews writer quotes that very verse in Hebrews 12 to the New Testament church and again tells us, don't be unholy like that, like Esau. What made him unholy? He sold his birthright for a single meal, for riches in the present that ended up cutting him off from the riches of eternity. And that was this man in the parable. He built his barns, and he lost his birthright. It won't be wealth per se, always, that's the problem, and it wasn't his wealth that was his problem. Although Jesus does warn us often about the hardening power of wealth. No, it was actually his lack of wealth, of real wealth, of what he could have accumulated in life but hadn't because he lived as if this life was all that there is, or at least that it was more immediately important to him. I bet he looked to the world. In fact, he probably looked to the church like the wisest investor in town. But as that great investor Warren Buffett likes to say, it's when the tide goes out that you see who's been swimming naked. And the tide will go out on every single human being. I wonder what the man who asked the question to Jesus thought of his answer. I wonder what you think. It's a real warning to us, friends, to those of us who have the light, who know the truth, not to hide from the truth, not to live self-absorbed lives that stop us becoming rich towards God. It's so easy for us to do that. How we do it, of course, will depend on our temperament. We're all different. Some of us are savers by nature. who hold back, who despise profligacy. Well, there's good in that. But, of course, the danger is just hoarding for hoarding's sake out of a desire for safety and security. You end up living miserably. It's astonishing how many older people begin to be like that and live in almost poverty. And then when they die, they discover they've left an absolute fortune. Other people, of course, are completely opposite. They're spenders by nature. They despise that kind of thing. And they love money because what it can bring them in terms of goods and possessions. They can squander their substance foolishly. But the point is, you see, both can be fools, can't they? With no real thought of God. With no thought of how God's gifts to us in this life are to be stewarded for Him and not for us. Not saved selfishly or spent selfishly but rather invested wisely in lasting treasure so as to be rich towards Him. And living like that, says Jesus, is to find real riches in life. And living like that is to find the real reason for our life on this earth. And that's what follows in verses 22 to 34. Maybe you're thinking, well, that's good. That's one in the eye for the wealthy. But I'm not a, a wealthy person. I'm not a business person or a professional. I'm a student. I've got no money. Or I don't have a job. Or maybe I'm an asylum seeker. So uh, I don't have barns or bank accounts to worry about. This doesn't apply to me. Well, we don't all have barns, but we do all have bodies. We do all have a life in this present world. And notice verse 22. Jesus turns directly to His disciples, and He says to them, Don't you be like that either. How could we be like that? They'd be thinking, that seems very unfair. Well, you can very easily, says Jesus, by being anxious about the things of this world, even trivial things, even day-to-day -day things like food and clothing, never mind barns and great wealth. You can be preoccupied in life by things you don't have and things that you think you need as you can by the things that you do have and want more of. Isn't that true? And Jesus' answer here is even more radical. You see, he doesn't say to his followers, you just all need to be a little bit less materialistic in life, and that'll be fine. No, he says, when you have a clear perspective on eternity, nothing, nothing in this world will preoccupy you, not even the most basic things in life like food and clothes, because you are living for a different world altogether. You are living for eternity, not for this world. See, not only will you be a fool in the world to come if you've lived only for this present world and its riches, 
You'll only actually discover true freedom in this world if you live now for the world to come. That's Jesus' words. You'll be liberated from life's worries only by trust in His heavenly care. And you'll be liberated from life's wealth harming you only by love for God's heavenly kingdom. And that's what verses 32 to 34 are teaching us. It's all about the preoccupations in this world and the real reason for life. Again, Jesus' main point is clear. Only the faithless, he says, live anxiously, forgetting that their Father is the ruler over all things and has given us His eternal kingdom. And that the true reason for our earthly life is to seek that kingdom and to find that kingdom and to be taken up with enriching and extending that kingdom. And so the priority in our lives now is to invest in that heavenly treasure, Verse 34, do you see? For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. What Jesus is constantly saying to his followers is that when you really grasp the gospel, you will have a completely new perspective about the future that transforms your whole outlook on the present and this present life. If you see properly what he's saying, as he put it back in chapter 11, verse 34, in the image of the eye. If you see properly what it's all about, your whole life will be flooded with light, a light that transforms your whole world and your whole life right now in the present. It's like getting new glasses when you badly needed them and when you suddenly realize how distorted your vision had actually become. My optician tells me I am her worst patient by a country mile because I never go to see her. There's nothing personal. It's just I avoid health professionals of all kind always because I'm a coward and I don't want to know the truth about what might be wrong with me. But uh, sometimes reality stares you in the face and uh, I discovered I really was struggling to read. I discovered I was getting a very sore neck because I was trying to take my glasses off and crane down so low to read my notes and I can hardly read them now. So I've been to see my optician and I'm now humbly limping into the world of very focal lenses, and I'm hoping for light to flood my body once again. It's kind of like trimming eyebrows and nose hair, isn't it, men? It's one of those (laughs) miserable aspects of growing old that you just have to humbly accept and get on with. Well, I hope my clarity of vision will soon be liberating, but Jesus is speaking about a far, far more important clarity of vision a clear perspective about life that will absolutely transform all of things in life right now. And he states it clearly if you look in verses 32 and 33. First verse 33, do you see? The reality that the only thing in life that is permanent, the only thing that can be relied on and whose treasure is worth having is the treasure of the kingdom of God, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief Uh, approaches, and no moth destroys. And therefore, clear vision tells you that only a life that is furnished with these things can last and can find true and lasting fulfillment. And second, look at verse 32. This is what God has already given us for those who trust in Jesus. It's your Father's good pleasure. It's His settled will to have given you the kingdom, he says, so fear not. The only thing that lasts and that is worth having in this world has been promised by God to us, to his little flock. And so when we know that we have the title deeds for something that's permanent, for a lasting home, why would we ever invest ourselves in something that is merely passing? The Cornhill students have had a couple of terms around the corner in the top floor of a rather grotty office block. And uh, the carpet tiles were all, half of them missing, the walls were tatty, and the central heating was either full on or full off. So you either boiled to death or froze to death. But it was only for a time until the new and permanent home was finished. And they knew they were going to inherit something wonderful. They trusted those who had promised it. So, of course, they put up some pictures and they made the place look half decent. They needed what they needed to do to get by. But it would have been ludicrous, wouldn't it, 
to spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds on that temporary office for something that was going to be passing and left behind and never gone back to again. A colossal waste of time and a huge diversion of vital resources that are needed to equip and provide for that which was to be a permanent ministry. Well, that is how we are to think of our whole lives, according to Jesus. We are living now in this world for our permanent home. And we have to see with that perspective. And when we do, that will transform the way we look at everything, even now in this life. And Jesus says, thinking like that will mean we are liberated from enslavement to earthly worries by trust in God's heavenly care. That's what verses 30, uh, 22 to 30 are saying. We're living now, he says, in the care of one who has already covenanted to give us his eternal kingdom, that which is permanent. How much more then will he be able to cope with providing for our mere temporary needs? If he knows our everlasting needs and has provided for them, how much more must he know our present needs? How much more? is the refrain here in these verses, isn't it? Just as it was back in chapter 11, verse 13. It's not that we have to become ascetics. It's not that we have to become hermits. Well, after all, even temporary accommodation needs some uh, provision and furnishings. But the point Jesus is making is we don't need to fear. Don't be anxious. Don't fear. Look around you, he says. See how wonderfully God has decorated and cared for even this passing world. He feeds the birds, verse 24. He decorates the earth with beautiful flowers, the glory of the lilies, verse 27. The beauty of grasses, verse 28, that even just last for a day. How much more does he value you and your life who have trusted in him, which is everlasting? Well, verse 24, much more than the birds. Verse 28, much more than the grass. He has given you a home in his everlasting kingdom by giving his own blood in the death of his son. So much does he love and care for you. But trust him. You don't need to be anxious about trivial things in this world, food and clothes and daily life, what job you'll get, what exams you'll get, who you'll marry or whether you'll marry, where you'll live, what you'll do. Only the faithless, like the pagans, live with anxiety like that, says Jesus. They don't know your heavenly Father, but you do. Look at verse 30. Your Father knows you need these things. So trust him, verse 31. Seek his kingdom, which he's promised you, and all that you need in this world will be given to you. Seek first these earthly things, set your heart on them, and you'll be anxious and miserable in this life, and you'll lose everything in the end. But seek what will last. You'll be liberated now from earthly worry, even about concerns of the things you do need in life. That's real gospel liberation. And in the same way, he says, if you live with this perspective... We're liberated from enslavement to worldly wealth by love for God's heavenly kingdom. That's verses 33 and 40, uh, 34. Liberation from all greed, from wrong ambition, from things we don't really need in life because we have real security, so we don't need to pursue these things that God may give us in life. Well, fine. Or he might not give them. Well, fine. They have no permanent value. It means we don't need to cling on to the things that God does give us as if they were for us instead of for using for Him. No. If His kingdom liberates us, we can become generous-hearted people using our personal wealth and our passing wealth for gain that is permanent. Jesus isn't advocating communism in verse 33. He's not saying we've got to give away everything and pauperize ourselves so we become a burden on others. Of course not. But he is advocating open-hearted and real generosity. And he's plain. He says that is not loss for us. It's gain. It's wealth transfer into non-wasting assets. 
and to the place where your heart already is, he says, if you're Christ's, and where your body will one day be permanently in the Father's kingdom. But verse 34 asks the question, doesn't it? Is your heart really there? Or are you perhaps deceiving yourself? It's very easy to do that. He's just shown us in that parable. How do you know? Well, that's easy, says Jesus. Verse 34, show me your treasure, and I'll tell you where your heart is. Where you're invested, well, that's where you're expecting to make real gain, isn't it? Your real citizenship is always betrayed by your chief concerns and who you support. Remember Norman Tebbit and his cricket test? That tells you which country you really love. Well, Jesus is just giving us the wallet test. It's just the same. What things empty your wallet most? That's where you're investing. And what things fill your thoughts most? Even your prayers. Is it Jesus' work and Jesus' people and their needs and the needs of his kingdom? Or is it me and my needs and my comfort and my finances and my career and my security and my well-being and my family? It's a pretty penetrating test, isn't it? especially when we realize that to invest in heavenly treasure in the Father's kingdom is to invest in a living kingdom. To invest in Jesus' kingdom is to invest in His little flock, in His people. And he was speaking about that last Sunday evening in 1 Corinthians 3. That's how you build for what lasts with gold and silver and precious stones, with everlasting treasure, building the church of Jesus Christ. That's what it means in verse 33, really, to give to the needy. And Jesus makes that clear and explicit in case we doubt it in verses 35 to 48, which are all about our preparedness for the world to come and the real reckoning for our lives. And again, it's a very clear message. Only the feckless, he says, will live carelessly, forgetting that Christ is the judge of all men. And will return to force a reckoning on our lives, which will determine our future reward or loss for all eternity. And so the priority, he says, for this life is to be a wise and faithful steward now in our responsibility to serve Christ's household, that is, his church, and not neglect it and far less to harm it. For everyone, verse 48 to whom much was given of him, much will be required. You see, Jesus says, in a very real sense, we are building our future now. And the key factor in whether we're building wisely and faithfully or foolishly and wickedly is love and care for the household of God. Do you see verse 43? Blessed is the servant whom his master finds doing that when he comes. That's the criterion of Jesus' judgment. Now, that shouldn't surprise us. Read Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus speaks about judgment day and the sheep and the goats. And it's very plain. You show that your heart loves Jesus, he says, if you love his brothers in the church. As you did to the least of these, my brothers, you did to me. That's how we know, says the Apostle John, that we've passed from death to life because we love the brothers. And remember, John says love is not just in word and talk, but in deed and truth. Deed and truth in love to Christ's brothers, according to Jesus, is the criterion, and a day of reckoning is coming. And so you must all be ready, he says, because you will all be held responsible. See, verse 35 to 40 just simply say we must all be ready, like servants waiting for the master to come back from a long Middle Eastern wedding. It could be any time. It could be the middle of the night. But what a joy to be ready when he comes and to find that what he is doing is inviting you to his own table and serving you at a party in your honor. That's what verse 37 says. What a blessing and what a horror not to be ready. Just as it's a horror in verse 39 to discover a break-in. You risk losing everything if you're not ready. So you must be ready, he says in verse 40. Because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And when he returns in glory to the earth, or whether he comes to call for every one of us in our individual life beforehand, 
Are you ready, says Jesus? Are you active in serving in his household? Or are you fast asleep? Because it's easy to let all kinds of material concerns squeeze us out of true fellowship of God, which we find in true fellowship with God's people, which we find in serving his household, that is, his church. But if you're not busy serving Christ's church, as opposed to just hitching a free ride, how do you think that when Christ returns on the day of reckoning, you'll suddenly be transformed into somebody who's an experienced and trusted servant who can be given much more to do? You haven't shown yourself to be responsible. So you must be ready, says Jesus, now, never asleep, by investing yourself and all your gifts in the treasure of serving Christ's household, serving His church in all the world. And there's no exception. And that's what verses 41 to 48 tell us. We will all be held responsible. You see, when Jesus talks like this, we find it so unnerving, especially these warnings about loss. And that's no doubt why Peter says in verse 41, Lord, uh, who is this for? Us? Surely not. Or is it for everybody else? You see, Jesus doesn't do that kind of dodge. He doesn't say, well, let's talk hypothetically about a particular group of people. Jesus looks us in the eye and says, you've all got a stewardship from God. The question is, who is the faithful and wise steward? In uh, the New Testament, Christian leaders are called stewards in God's household. Titus 1 verse 7 calls the overseer that. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians, calls himself a steward of the mysteries of God. And, of course, he goes on to say that it is important and required of a steward that he be found faithful. But, you see, the apostle Peter tells us very plainly in 1 Peter 4 that we are all stewards of God's varied graces. And we are to be good stewards, loving one another earnestly, he says, from a pure heart. That's just what Jesus is painting here in this picture, isn't it? So graphically. Blessed is the servant who is found so doing when his master returns. But how terrible to be exposed as a fraud and as false, and in the end to be shown to have not had faith, to be unbelieving. It's not just a profession of faith, you see, according to Jesus, but it's the obedience of faith that shows whether faith is true and real and fruitful. And that will happen, says Jesus, and the loss will be terrible for some. Look at verse 46, destruction along with all the unfaithful, the unbelieving, those who have no faith. Unbelief, it seems, will exist even in the household of Christ right up until the end. And there'll be some terrible, terrible shocks on the day when all things are revealed and some tragic disappointments. Surely that's what verses 47 and 48 speak of. There'll be those who have been given much, but through half-heartedness, through having an eye too much on the treasures and the prizes of this present world, they'll have been found not to invest it wisely. And at last, then, too late, they'll realize their loss. And what could be worse than to enter eternity with the ever-present blow of knowing that you've missed out on fully realizing the joy of your greatest potential of what you could have been for the cause of the kingdom of God? To know that itself would be to suffer terrible loss. To know that your life's work, what you've invested your life in, has all been burnt up and nothing remains because it was wood and straw and stubble. What will that actually mean? Well, I think Jesus' answer here is, don't be the person to find that out. Don't let that be you. It seems that there will be some, perhaps many, who have known Christ's demand on their life but have resisted, have have shown neglect for their true stewardship. And I find to be feckless, as my dictionary says, with no sense of responsibility, indifferent, lazy. 
But others will have responded, says Jesus, to the gospel call as willing and faithful servants, loving Christ's household, feeding his flock, investing in the needy, encouraging the weak, never giving up. And the one, alas, will on that great day find all his life's work just coming back to beat him. What a terrible blow that must be. But the other, says Jesus, will find, no doubt with incredulity perhaps, that his work for Jesus' precious people all through his life abounds in everlasting blessing, the blessing of more service and greater responsibility forever. He will set him over all his possessions. Two very different priorities in life leading to two very different paths, both in this world and in the world to come. Even, it seems, for those identified as genuine followers of Jesus. We can't miss, can we, Jesus' unmistakable focus on a dividing of the ways for all eternity. But as he says in verse 51, where we began, he came to force that division. Because you can't have the treasures of earth and the treasures of heaven. It's either treasures, riches for yourself, or it's riches towards God. And decision has to be made, says Jesus, now, in this world. That's the whole reason for our life. It's a costly decision to lay aside the treasures of earthly riches. Perhaps most costly of all is when that involves the laying aside of relationships, earthly relationships, even within our families. That's what verse 53 speaks of, and it's painful. People who love us but whose misplaced love would stop us from embracing the stewardship that Christ himself has called us to. That can be so, so hard. But what could be more foolish, friends, than to pour your life's worth into a world that's fading and into riches that will ultimately fail and even into relationships that will ultimately fade? Don't be a fool, says Jesus. And don't be afraid. Have faith and be fruitful. And you'll be free now, truly free in this world, and you know that you will be truly fruitful for the world to come. Amen. Let's pray. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. O God, who has prepared for them that love thee such good things as past man's understanding, pour into our hearts such love toward thee that we, loving thee above all things, may obtain thy promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to sing to end our service hymn number 855. Number 855, which reminds us, Go, labor on while it is day. The world's dark night is hastening on. Work with all speed while still you may. See that the gospel's work is done. Number 855.
And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.